Uh, so now we go into pedagogical methods. So that worldview then influences how we teach. Uh, most current methods, and I'm getting this from Korchak, actually, uh, in his book, Serpents in the Classroom, uh, most current methods can be reduced to two main camps, a secular humanistic or Marxist camp or a Gnostic camp, and we'll talk about those things. So first, John Dewey. Many of us have heard of Dewey. Uh, he, he signed the Humanist Manifesto um, that some of us have probably read. Man's intellectual powers were enough to solve the, the world's problem. Again, we see children born pure, naturally curious, and then they ought to then pursue the things that interest them. Well, if we allow students right now to pursue the things that interest them, most of our students are going to do nothing but sit around and play video games. And while those, that is fine for leisure, it must be done in moderation, like everything else, right? Um, I'm mean. My kids get a, a half an hour each weekend. I'm a terrible, terrible father. I make them play and go outside and do those things. Um, but if I only let them pursue the things that interest them, they're... they're knowledge base, their desires are going to be very, very narrow. And that's going to be a problem. We're going to talk about why that's a problem in a bit. So proper education would be the good soil that made the children bloom into these beautiful flowers. This is what he, what he uses. So education then, and, and this, is, this is now the switch, right? This is where education becomes kind of king. Education is to redeem society. Not a savior to redeem man from his sins, but education to redeem society. And thus to redeem society, it must be practically focused on real life experiences. The child then is the center of, the, of these educational experiences. And if, once again, just given the right environment and training, they can find the truth within themselves. That's Dewey. Dewey's fun. Anybody ever heard of this guy? Vygotsky? You should have. Vygotsky has influenced almost every major educational training manual in America today. Vygotsky was also a Leninist that served under Stalin and was the director of education. He was called the Mozart of psychology. And he was used to implement communist training into the schools. This is his fundamental worldview. And if you are in an education training program, you are reading his stuff without even knowing it. That's pretty terrible, isn't it? Uh, so man is not sinful. And once liberated from the agents of oppression, sound familiar, hopefully, could be free from all selfishness and be perfect. So Vygotsky's reform centered on removing anything that he or the party more correctly, saw as oppressive. So no dogmatic teachings, unless it was their dogma. Only practical education, so you can see how he is similar to Dewey in this, this vein. Only practical education can prepare the, the students to actually then go be the cog in the wheel of the workforce. Right? Teachers were not masters of their subjects. And this is where we got in, who had asked about teachers as facilitators? Yeah, Marshall, you asked about teachers as facilitators. This is where we really get it, right? So teachers aren't masters of subjects, but facilitators leading the children to find this deeper understanding of what the group thought was worthy of their time and effort. You see how this lends itself perfectly to indoctrination of Marxist doc dogma, right? We'll just, we'll just call it what it is. And the group work then, not individual work, but group work was key. Individualistic thought, especially individualistic excellence, is banished in the name of conformity to the collective. Right? So, uh, Vygotsky would have been a big proponent of participation trophies so everybody feels good and part of the group. Right? And we don't give, we don't give anybody the game ball to make them feel like they've achieved more, right? Sorry, I coach travel baseball and softball, so you'll, you'll have some of those analogies built in. So common themes in the secular humanists, reduction of God and elevation of human reason, reduction of the individual and elevation of the group, reduction of a love of learning, learning for the sake of learning, and elevation of simple practical learning, and an intense hatred of free thinking and capitalism, and we're going to see 
We're going to see how that plays out <laughs> in a bit. All right, any questions on the secular humanists? All right, now we get to Maria. Maria Montessori, she was a doctor actually, and she believed um, that through observation, she had found the optimal learning environment. And you can see some of Vygotsky and Dewey in here. Child-centered learning, where the students choose what interests them the most, and, and that produces the best environment. These are often found to be hands-on activities where the child learns more from their peers than through the teacher, through collaborative play and engagement, right? She regarded children, and if you've ever, anybody read Montessori, especially her lectures, oh my goodness, this woman worshipped children. They were innately holy. Now, I'm raising six kids. <laughs> They are not innately holy, ever. From the, I mean, especially with my genes. From the moment they came out, I may not have a redhead in the family besides me, but they all have my mentality. And they came out kicking and screaming, and they haven't stopped since. They are not holy. But she said that they are innately holy. Called them spiritual embryos, spiritual energies, whose divine natures... No. Again, Christology, right? Who has the divine nature? Jesus, right? Divine natures needed to be properly nurtured so that they would be agents for the divine redemption of the world. And this redemption was the temporal salvation of the world. And now keep in mind that Maria is writing right after the first two world wars. So she's seen humanity for an extended period of time at its absolute worst. And this permeates what she, what she believes um, and how she teaches. But we can see here that elevation of children as God, right? They are the absolute, they are, they are the saviors, right? They're the absolute saviors. So this is from her 1846 London lecture, or 1946. Um, it is through the activity of the child that the mind of man is created. Not through the activity of God that creates the mind of man or that mind, man's mind actually participates in God through contemplation of divine things. Uh, but it's the child. We must consider, therefore, the child who has this power, this activity, who is the builder of man, who is a spiritual embryo. Naughtiness will disappear if we give children the right environment at a sufficiently early age. And this environment must provide a great deal of mental food and warm, loving treatment. If she is right, why are we not better? Almost all of our schools, including our Lutheran schools, buy into that. They may not fully buy into the whole spiritual embryos thing, but they do certainly buy into if we just give them the right environment, if we just bring them up, then the naughtiness goes away. Right? It'll take care of itself. If we just love them, if we just improve their self-esteem, well, a prideful sinner is still a sinner, right? So she, she completely obliterates again original sin and the effects of sinfulness, denies natural law. Jean Piaget, anybody heard of Jean Piaget? All right, Piaget. Um, especially if you've been in education, you probably learned uh, his stages of cognitive development, um, which can be helpful in understanding how things develop and how, how people learn. Um, but his underlying presuppositions to these stages of cognitive development are hugely problematic. Knowledge is constructed by the child himself. So the key to good development is the ability for the child to construct their own understanding of the world around them. I'm going to let that hang for a bit because that, that's not good <laughs> to construct your own understanding. right? This is my truth and you can't tell me anything different. Psychology and sociology, he believed, had destroyed classical theology with the concept of a transcendent God. Now, we're good Lutherans. I call the Lutheran church the church of both and, right? So are we saints or are we sinners? We are both. Is it the bread and wine or is it the body and blood? It's both. Is it water or is it actual cleansing of sin? It is both. Is God transcendent or imminent? God is both. 
right? We have to have the transcendent God, the God that is utterly other, that produces that great awe. We have to have that. We have to have the God that created everything out of nothing through a word. We have to have the God who in His perfect justice can punish people for all of eternity in hell. We have to have that. But we also have to have the God that became man and made His dwelling among us, that bore all of our sins on the cross and atoned for them in our place and then defeated death by rising for us and that will never leave nor forsake us, who is surely with us to the very end of the age. We have to have both of those. But Piaget gets rid of the transcendent God. No fear, no awe, none of that. God speaks directly from within and only from within. There is no external word for Piaget. There is no reliance upon the scriptures. Never mind the knowledge of God in, in his entirety comes from the external word, right? Revealed knowledge. And that that knowledge that comes internally for Piaget is comprehended only in the human mind. Yeah, there's a lot. We could spend a whole hour just dissecting that, I think. So here's Piaget on play and development. Each time one prematurely teaches a child something he could have discovered himself, that child is kept from inventing it and consequently from understanding it completely. Children should be able to do their own experimenting and their own research. Teachers, of course, can guide them by providing appropriate materials. But the essential thing is that in order for a child to understand something, he must construct it himself. He must reinvent it. Every time we teach a child something, we keep him from inventing it himself. On the other hand, that which we allow him to discover by himself will remain with him visibly for the rest of his life. I don't know about you all, but there was a point in time where I had to teach my child how to use a steak knife. I would never throw down a hunk of meat in front of my four-year-old, grab a steak knife and slam it down and just sit and wait. Let's see what happens. Right? We have to instruct. Yes? So here's a different example. Um, you can teach your child the Pythagorean theorem, right? Mm -hmm. you can memorize it, and this is important. Yep. Uh, but what if at a later stage when they're capable of um, logic and derivation, you ask them, okay, now derive it for me without telling them how. Yeah. Um, maybe two out of three kids wouldn't be able to figure it out. Sure. Um, but don't you think there's some value? Yes, that? again, both and, right? Maybe run into errors and try multiple times. And Absolutely. Eventually figure out how to derive. But you've got to give them something at the beginning. The way he frames this is you don't impose anything on the child. If you want them to learn something, you've got to just kind of let them go. And as teachers, we, we are constantly giving them, and this is what I was talking about even with art, right? So if we go back to that learning through imitation, there is a time and place where once the foundation is laid, experimentation should occur. Especially if we are producing that natural inquisitiveness, that natural thirst for knowledge that we all have, right? That gets stomped out over time. Um, and I'll argue later that we actually do that through the way we structure school. We stomp out that inquisitiveness. Um, but there is something valuable. So that one out of three, the sense of accomplishment of figuring that out, the sense of drive, I like math. I was able to figure this out. I want to go do more. I want more of this. I'm teaching myself calculus right now in all of my spare time because I stink at math and calculus is really hard, especially for me. But each time I, I am able to figure something out, that's great. But that wasn't in a vacuum, right? I've got a book. I've got people I go to when I just can't figure it out and I'm like, I need help, right? But those things are good, but you have to have a basis. You have to have a foundation. His, his Piaget's developmental uh, um, stages allow this to happen at the very earliest stages and can be taken completely off the rails. So then if you take his viewpoint to that extreme, mm -hmm. which, which you're saying he does, um, it's pretty easily falsifiable if you consider that like even our knowledge of something like mathematics is built right. upon centuries of, yeah. of people very, very slowly figuring things out. Correct, right? So, I mean, what, one of my favorite, and I think I actually quoted in here somewhere, is um, uh, 
Newton talking about, I see as far as I can by standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Which is really an appropriation from a medieval philosopher, but we won't worry about that. We just, Newton's more well known, so I just stick with that. Um, you have to have those people that go before, right? This is actual true progress, not in the progressive sense that it's often taken, but this is how real progress happens, right? You give them so something good, true, and beautiful, you teach them on that, and then once you've laid that foundation, now we go. And this is why his stages of cognitive development are good in a sense if framed in the right way, but if taken in his way, can be problematic. Yeah. So common themes then of these Gnostics are that children are perfect, adults should learn from them and not the other way around. Proper education does not come from external, but from internal. And that the mind, right, this is where the Gnostic term is, right, that it's the focus on the mind and not the actual whole person. The mind, particularly that of the unsullied child, is the key to future progress of the human race toward perfection in this life. These are our keys to these folks. All right, so the summary of the second head of the Hydra. Children are pure. The environment is everything. Self-teaching is more important than instructor-led teaching. Personal interests are more important than eternal truths. And that is a very utilitarian approach, that focus on the practicality of what is learned. Um, and, and if you've ever taught, and even if you're a parent and you had your child come home and say, why am I learning this? When am I ever going to use this? Right? Uh, I even said that as a kid, and now I kick myself for it because I didn't put in the effort in subjects that I really should have, that now I really want to know. Um, so that's the second Hydra's head. Any, yeah? I just wondered if we should take maybe a five minute break or something. Sure, we can take a five minute break. But I'll go quickly through the third, because if you're paying attention to your packet, we've got a lot to get through. All right, perfect. All right, so we're, we're back on. Uh, we have just lopped the second head of the hydra off uh, and are moving into the third. Um, third head is the curricula. Now, um, we, let's get terminology straight. Uh, for you Latin scholars, is curricula singular or plural? It's plural because it's a neuter, right? Curriculum is singular. Uh, so a lot of times we use these terms wrong. We talk about curriculums, um, which is incorrect. It should be a curricula. Uh, if we're talking about a specific curriculum, the curriculum, singular. Uh, so just so you know why it goes back and forth. Uh, I get a lot of questions about that. Um, if you want to know why that is, see me and I'll teach you Latin. Uh, so our worldview is shaped by our ideology, or as we've seen with some of the... Uh, the confluence of ideologies, it could be more than one. And thus, the curriculum is the vehicle through which the worldview or ideology is communicated to the, uh, the students. Um, worldview and ideology manifest themselves in the aim or the goal of the school. And this aim or goal, if you think of, if any of you are involved in education, almost every school has got a mission and vision statement, right? And those mission and vision statements should be the aim or the goal of that school. When the child or student is done here, this is what we want them to look like. This is what we want them to be able to do, right? And then the curricula is the vehicle through which we accomplish or fail to accomplish that aim or that goal. I thought this little thing on progressive education was kind of fun. Progressive education philosophy emphasizes the development of the whole child, physical, emotional, and intellectual. Learning is based on the individual needs, abilities, and interests of the student. This leads to students being motivated and enthusiastic about learning. Uh, I don't think that's true at all. <laughs> And we're going to talk about why in a little bit. Uh, so curricula. The worldview ought to drive what is and what is not taught in a school, uh, just as it should drive how one teaches. So as we said, the first head of the hydra informs the next two, right? A school's stated purpose is a rephrasing of its worldview and gives the foundation for its choice of curricula. The reason why I use curricula there is... Most of our schools, including our Lutheran schools, don't have an all-encompassing curriculum.
curriculum written and integrated by the same folks. They piecemeal their curriculum from curricula, from multiple sources, right, and try to make it work for them. Um, this is problematic, um, and it makes it hard for teachers to integrate knowledge into various subjects in their own classroom. Um, I know always what we're doing in math and science in our school because I read and do what the students are doing. And I do that intentionally so I can integrate that into what we are doing in my classes, right? So if we're going through uh, Euclid's elements and talking about uh, establishing and proving certain, um, certain theories, and I'm teaching logic, and we're talking about the flow of logic from two premises into the conclusion, I can build those two things together, but I can't if I don't know what the, what the other teachers are teaching. Um, so I, I do that intentionally so the student is constantly comparing and pulling in information from other, other classes that they're taking. Um, there are five types of curriculum. Uh, there shouldn't be a period. There are curriculum ideologies. Rational humanism, progressivism, critical theory, reconceptualism, and cognitive pluralism. We are going to talk about all five of these, but n almost none of them are standalone. Almost every type of school that we have right now takes elements from these different types of ideologies to create what, what we have as a, as a kind of common way of teaching, right? Um, you may have heard of some of these. Most of us has probably heard of the first three. The second two, reconceptualism and cognitive pluralism, you may not have heard uh, about. So rational humanism, uh, oddly enough, a focus on reason, uh, minimizes human revel or religious rev revelation, utilizes the scientific method as the unifying principle, uh, of, of the entire educational system. Uh, it's often focused on humanities and the great books uh, in a way that stimulates analysis and at times controversy in the classroom. So for those that are familiar with classical education, most of the ACCS schools, the Association of Classical Christian Schools, that are part of the neoclassical movement, actually fall underneath rational humanism. Even though they may not minimize religious revelation because most of those ACCS schools, they're reform schools, um, so they're Bible-believing schools, but all the rest of these elements there's a big emphasis on. Uh, but there are, in addition to ACCS schools, there are classical schools that are secular in nature. And I've got us an example here. This is Nashville Classical Charter School. And this is taken directly from their mission and vision statements. Remember I told you mission and vision is where we find out what their worldview is? So when your kids go to school, if they go to a school, the very first thing you should do is analyze the mission and vision statement and ensure that that worldview is your worldview. If you don't do that and you just show up and everything sounds nice and then your child starts becoming something other than what you wanted, uh, go back to the mission and vision and see if there's a disconnect there. So first and foremost, Nashville Classical Charter Schools are diverse communities. So this is already part of the progressive right from the get-go, right? This is the thing that they want to highlight. Research study after research study focusing on scientific method and the implementation of data show diverse school communities benefit everybody. We believe our school's racial, geographic, economic, and ethnic diversity is at the core of who we are. This is a worldview, right? the core of who we are, how we succeed, and why families choose us. Our diversity is also why we are committed to thoughtful, intentional policies and procedures. We believe in building a welcoming community for everyone, especially the students and families that were historically excluded from and denied educational opportunities. This is Marxism. Cultural Marxism bled into mission statement, right? Our curriculum is rigorous. Research, again, focus on research shows that the brain is a muscle and like any muscle it gets bigger as you use it. Our children read great books, so focus on the great books, they write essays and grapple with real world problems in new and interesting ways. They don't grapple with real world problems in ways that have been proven to work, but new and interesting ways. Why? Because it is up to them to figure out how to solve the world's problems. Right? So at first glance you read these things you're like, oh that's not so bad. 
But when you actually know the development and the history behind these things, you begin to see how these very subtle things creep into these statements. We get a, dedicate time to teaching procedures and routines from school uniforms to classroom layouts to daily closing circles. And we believe structure unlocks safety and creativity. I'm not sure what that actually means. Uh, our intentional classrooms, that's another buzzword for progressive education, um, intentionality, right? Our intentional classrooms lead scholars to feel like part of a team, groupthink, right? Everyone is included, seen, and recognized. Our structured classrooms create the psychological safety that scholars need to step outside of their comfort zone and take risks. Another, another thing that you'll, you'll see uh, in a lot of schools like this, they're not students, they're scholars. They're called scholars right from the get-go. Dr. Vietz, are you a scholar in your field? Would you consider yourself a scholar in your field? I would consider you a scholar in your field, right? Help me out here, man. Yeah, some would say so, right? Um, when, when would you have considered yourself to attain the title scholar? Perhaps when I graduated. With your PhD, probably, right? Where you've, you've now not only mastered, but you have a doctorate in your field, right? Someone has, has recognized me as scholars that went before me. Yes. Me yeah. Scholars. Right? So there was, there was personal achievement and work and dedication that went in, not just from you, but from your family as well while you were doing these things. Uh, as someone going through them right now, I know how important that is. Um, but the bottom line is, you weren't a scholar when you entered kindergarten. You were a student. One might say you were a disciple of sorts, right? Because this comes from a Latin word that means to learn. Uh, and while you were learning, you were not a master and you certainly weren't a scholar. But this psychological move of turning kids into scholars automatically is only to serve their own self-esteem, right? All while, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Vietz, uh, to be a scholar, you need to have learned the foundations and fundamentals of your discipline and then made a new contribution in concert with those fundamentals. Yes? Yeah. Right? You can't write a dissertation on something that someone's already done. Right. It has to be a new and then lasting contribution to your field. So this is what we were talking about before, where it's not all creativity without the foundation. It is the foundation first that actually allows creativity to be done in the best and fullest sense. Whereas if you're a scholar right from the get-go and you don't have a foundation, you only have creativity and we're saying, oh, you're a scholar, right? That's all, all of this is problematic and all of this leads into uh, this type of rational humanism uh, at its core. So this is a continuation from the same school. We believe in closing the knowledge gap through social studies, science, and great books. In our curriculum, scholars build background and contextual knowledge. So notice, they build background and contextual knowledge. They are not given, they are not taught, they build, right? Scholars express knowledge through writing and use knowledge to unlock opportunity and understand the world. So we're not teaching things that are good and true and beautiful for their own sake. We're teaching them in accordance with their usefulness to us. To unlock opportunity first and foremost. And what they mean by opportunity is most likely go to a good college, get a good job, buy a nice house, retire comfortably, right? We believe excellence is a habit. I like that. And habits are key to future success and self-actualization. <laughs> habits are not useful insofar as they inculcate someone with virtue and form character, which is historically what we've believed in the church that a habitus was, but for self-actualization. In other words, we believe school is preparation for life and should foster personal excellence alongside academic success. So you see how these things that we've talked about in this historical development have permeated almost every aspect of this mission and vision statement of this school. Right? And this is a successful school. 
There's no doubt about it. But there are things that are problematic with this type of, of thinking as well. All right, let's move on to progressivism. Problem-centered curriculum, this is taken from Dewey. Complete act of thought, meaning movement from purpose to ex experimental treatment to assessment of results, again, that scientific method. Hard science is the model for this. They start from where the child is. This is from Vygotsky. Each child must be taught differently based upon where they are at. Rooted in evolutionary and psychological views of humanity. Again, the student first mentality with a view toward continual betterment of society. And then the community is elevated at the expense of individual freedom and achievement. Examples, Milwaukee Public Schools. Milwaukee Public Schools is a diverse district that welcomes all students and prepares them for success in higher education, post-education opportunities, work and citizenship. Again, utility, practicality, right? Why does this education exist? Only in preparation for higher education, post-education, work and citizenships. If that is all education is for, the student has absolutely every right to say, why am I doing this? If I'm going to be a doctor, why are you making me read all of Plato's Republic, Pastor Koble? Because Plato's Republic is good for you and it will make you a better doctor because it will make you a better human being by understanding it, right? But again, I don't even answer that way because that's utility. Education's not about simple practicality. Vision, Milwaukee Public Schools will be among the highest student growth school systems in the country. That's pretty easy to say considering only once in the last 15 years have Milwaukee Public Schools on 8th grade standardized test reached the basic category in either math or science. Once in 15 years. So it's pretty, pretty easy to grow when you're already sucking the bottom, huh? Sorry, that was a little facetious <laughs> and snarky. Sometimes the marine in me comes back out. All district staff will be committed to providing an equitable educational environment that is what? Child-centered, supports achievement, respects and embraces diversity. Schools will be safe, welcoming, well-maintained, and accessible community centers. Milwaukee Public Schools just told us that they care more about inclusive daycare than the education of a child. Than, than turning children into good and virtuous adults. They don't want to turn children into good and virtuous adults. They want to turn children into people that simply feel safe and welcome. Relevant, rigorous, and successful instructional programs will be recognized and replicated. I don't know, I also don't know what that means. It sounds nice though, doesn't it? The district and its schools will collaborate with students, families, and community for the benefit of all, right? Again, Marxist undertones throughout the entirety of their core beliefs. Students come first, not content, right? Our schools are not important because they teach what is good, true, and beautiful, but our schools are important because we got students. In the Marine Corps, we called this a self-licking ice cream cone. <laughs> you may call it a circular argument or something of that nature, but gosh darn it, people like me because I am looking in a mirror and saying it, right? For you Saturday Night Live fans. <laughs> Educators and school staff have high expectations for all students and provide the foundation for their academic success. Notice what's missing. Students, and, or educators and school staff, at no time do the parents get tasked with having high expectations. At no time are the parents tasked with providing for the foundation. It's the school. So now we're shifting, this is that three estates, instead of going from bottom up, we're going top down, right? We're going top down. Equity drives all district decision making. What is equity? What, am, what, are, what are they meaning by equity? Is it, what is that? Equal outcomes, not equal opportunity, right? Equal outcomes, group think, right? We have, to, we have to all get A's, right? 
Why? Because if my child doesn't get an A, then clearly they are defective in some way, shape, or form, and that hurts their self-esteem. Never mind that a C is actually what an average student should be getting. If they are doing exactly what they are supposed to be doing and not exceeding the expectations, but also not going under the expectations, they're getting a C. And that's okay. That's all right. But, but because grade school and high school are only good insofar as they prepare us to go to a good college, to get a good job, so on and so forth. Now, if they have anything other than A's, it's the end of the world as we know it, for all you REM fans. <laughs> Sorry, man, I'm an 80 and 90s kid. I love music. Involved families are integral. So the last thing is involved families to increasing student achievement. Not being the foundation, but building upon what we are doing as the school. Now the family is integral to increasing what we have done. Right? Once you see it, you can't unsee it, right? It's everywhere in these things. Student voice is encouraged and respected. Never mind, you know, the expertise of the teacher being encouraged and respected. I don't know. Quality community partnerships add value. Increased operational and financial efficiencies are consistently pursued to support learning opportunities of our students. They want you to know that they're using your tax money well. Central services support student achievement, efficient and effective operations, and student family and community engagement. And then last but not least, the resounding gong. Public education provides the cornerstone of American democracy. Justice and liberty for all men. All right. Move on to critical theory. I know I'm whipping through these a little, a little quick. Um, but I'd actually like to get to some conversation. I only got an hour left, and I made a lot of slides. Rooted in the Marxism found at the Frankfurt School, uh, politics and power are the two concepts through which all of the pedagogy is then evaluated. Uh, it seeks to provide enlightenment, emancipation, and liberation through social justice, solidarity with the marginalized, personal autonomy, and self-determination. This comes right from the critical theory playbook. Uh, their main goal is to find and eliminate hidden biases in thinking and curricula, especially in those that are not part of the marginalized population. So most of you in here, right, your hidden biases need to be identified. No one else's but yours. Samuel. As a student of political philosophy, usually we would combine politics and power. How are you differentiating those two topics? So I, again, I'm taking this, these, this is verbatim off of the 1619 site. Right, so I'm using them in the way that that they do. It is it is combined in an actual thought because politics are only the extension and implementation of the power. It's the the vehicle through which which power is exercised. But remember, they also think that politics being first and foremost way. But then we also do it in our day to day lives. Yes, we are, like Plato says, political animals, right? And as Aristotle affirms, we are political animals. Um, and yet, uh, your hidden biases as a white man uh, and how they interact, that is how you exert power over the marginalized. And that may be in a political sense or an apolitical sense. Um, so, I, don't, I, I, I clearly don't agree, but I'm, I'm taking these things verbatim off of their off of the 1619 site so let's talk about 1619 again these are taken from from their stuff America is systematically racist due to its past and the founding fathers ownership of slaves and the reason why I'm not using so the, for the first two I used specific school mission and vision so if we want to talk about hidden biases try to find a school that says unequivocally that they use this and you're gonna have a really hard time doing it because they don't want you to know that they're using it. There's a reason that our public school systems don't actually show curriculum. Now, For our classical school, not only do I make available everything that we teach, where we get it, I invite parents regularly to sit in on class at any time unannounced and to come in and look at the stuff. Read it. Right? I've made Pastor Rafa read more stuff this, you know, this year this semester and a half than he's probably read in the last two years because I keep giving him all this extra homework. You're welcome. 
So this, again, taken directly from Matthew Desmond. So the New York Times Magazine of August 2019 was what kicked off the 1619 Project. And so taken directly from this, in order to understand the brutality of American capitalism, you have to start at the plantation, right? This is a loaded sentence, an absolute loaded sentence. So from the very onset, capitalism bad, right? So we see the Marxist bend right from the beginning. Brutality, this is the confluence of politics and power, right? Plantation has to be then the lens with which we see and interpret all of American history. Past and America present. It has to be the lens for this mindset, right, for critical theory. Um, so in this one sentence, we have all of the tenets that I listed on the last slide taken from their website. Right? And it embodies the entirety in one sentence. And that's, that's how they view, they view the world. <clears throat> now these last two you might be a little less familiar with. Reconceptualism. America's school, schools are too industrial. So those block buildings with uh, uniforms and desks that everybody has to sit and has to be nice and neat. Especially if, I don't know, your teacher and headmaster is a Marine. Things got to be in a row. Right? Dressed and aligned, as we would say in the core. They lack, though, the lived experience, the imagination. So we need to then rethink or reconceptualize education. And their fundamental presupposition here is that life isn't a scientific experiment with all the answers there. Not that they downplay the role and value of science, but that education shouldn't be formed solely upon the scientific method. But rather, life is an exploration of possibilities that allow one to successfully adapt to a technocratic routine. Now again, taken from the reconceptualization playbook that defines these things, um, not totally clear of what they're, they're really trying to say. But let's look at an example. The Milwaukee Environmental Sciences Academy. Anybody know this school exists? Milwaukee? Okay. So, Mesa adopted the expeditionary learning education model. And it's that model, even though this is called an Environmental Sciences Academy, and I just talked about how they don't put a big premium on sciences and the scientific method, although they use it. But this model, the expeditionary learning education model, is what is actually part of this reconceptualization. So they combine uh, academic rigor and character development through designing learning projects. So when we talk about project-based learning, this is part of this reconceptualization, right? Uh, every, but th there's also, again, Marxist trends and progressive trends in this, in that most of the work done is not individual work with individual excellence or not, but it's group work, project work that we do together. Um, Milwaukee Environmental Sciences Academy is a school that upholds the consistency of expeditionary learning uh, and professional collaboration among staff to ensure the achievement and engagement of, again, every scholar, not student. Expeditionary learning is an educational approach that takes learning beyond the classroom and immerses students in real-world experiences. So again, education is not about goodness, truth, and beauty. It's not about timeless truths that are used to develop men and women of character and virtue. Instead, education is about simple lived experiences, usefulness, being able to interact with the world. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be concerned with those things, but this is primary, right? This is, this is primary. And they talk about character development, but that's only secondary to this. Uh, so expeditionary learning emphasizes learning through expeditions where students engage in hands-on project and field work to explore compelling to topics. Now what's a compelling topic? One that the student is interested in, right? So again, it's a choose-your-own-adventure for those of us that grew up reading those books. It's a choose-your-own-adventure type of education. I get to pick. One of the key principles of expeditionary learning is character development. So in addition to academic growth, EL schools prioritize the development of students' character traits, such as perseverance, empathy, and responsibility. Now notice, 
It explains how, through expeditionary learning, it achieves its goals. It does not do that through character development. It doesn't tell you how they develop these things. It just says, these are nice and this is what we want to do. But it doesn't give you any type of, of how. That's why I don't think it's actually a very high priority to these things. Finally, cognitive pluralism. Focus, focuses first and foremost on communication, not only verbal and written, but what we call encoding and decoding symbols. So through art, through poetry, through computer coding and decoding, all of these things are part of this cognitive pluralism. And it's built, and I like this part, on Aristotle's three different forms of knowing, theoretical knowledge, practical knowledge, productive knowledge. So notice Aristotle, the utility, right? The productive knowledge is third. So you have to know the theoretical, then the practical, then the productive, all in concert with each other, and not just the practical and productive. For, you know, you got to have a foundation here. Primar primarily focused on math, science, and reading, and there's no, no specific uh, examples of this. This is actually more of a, a newer uh, way of looking at things. Um, and I couldn't find any examples of schools, but in terms of educational theorists, this is identified as, as the third or the fifth ideology. So, this is the Hydra's third head. All of these, yeah, I tried to give you a lot of cool pictures of Hydra's, right? Um, so, all of these types uh, focus internally, either on reason or experience or individual imagination. None of them stem from an inherently Christian worldview, although many Christian schools utilize one or a combination of these models. Science and the scientific method inform methodology in most of these schools. So let's talk about this a little bit. These models that we've, we've now engaged in, do we think that they're conducive to Christian education and upbringing? Yes or no? Anybody? Bueller? <laughs> Yes, ma'am. The first thing I notice is that, well, particularly with the Marxist um, form of, we were talking about the third head of the Hydra, like the Marxist um, aspect of it, it, it's inherently setting down a negative, uh, a negative narrative for, for our society, for education. So you have, um, the, the narrative is all things begin with oppression. Mm -hmm. Whatever uh, whatever traits people dwell afterwards is all from uh, oppression. So if you have a, an inherently negative view of education or an anti, an anti um, I'm not quite sure how to describe it, but it, it's a fighting against uh, something rather than fighting for something. Right. That is, that's certainly not uh, scripturally based because you, you want to strive for something that is good, something that is positive. You're fighting for something rather than against that thing. That yeah, it does. And, and, and this, is, this is intentional, right? Because if you, if you get a population of people to feel I'll give you a great example. Uh, Marines go through boot camp, 13 weeks, and the first phase of boot camp is the breaking down phase, right? Where they, they make you feel like you can't do anything right. Uh, they punish the entirety of the group for the sins of the one, right? I remember one time we were standing in inspection and one guy forgot his canteen cup. And he just happened to be the guy that they said, look, let me see if your canteen cup's clean. And he goes, I don't have it. Right? We got hammered for like half a day for this dude forgetting his canteen cup. We hated our drill instructors so much as a collective group that we would have done anything to overcome them as a group. Right? So if, if you can make people feel like they're oppressed and believe that they're oppressed, you can control the narrative and make them do what you want. Our drill instructors had us exactly where they wanted us. Taking care of each other, uh, uh, policing each other, right? Correcting each other before they had to do it. That's exactly what they wanted us to do, right? Now, that's a, a positive example of this oppressive type of thing, but that's not what happens in a lot of the Marxist ideologies. They leave people in the oppressed state so that they can further and actually oppress them and control them, right? Because then you can, you can control the narrative. And if you can control the narrative, 
and you can control the, the feeling of the people of being in, oppressed, you can guide them. Like I said, we talked about this earlier, right? People are naturally lemmings. If you ever played the video game, you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, they follow. They follow along. They, they don't want to lead. Uh, they just want to follow. Pastor Fisher. Do you see that, that the uh, complete and utter um, dependence on Fauci during the pandemic as part of the technocratic credit? Yeah. That and the technocratic being control of the media and, and influence and selective reporting. A governmental expert in the technocratic, right? Right, yeah, absolutely. You always have the governmental expert that controls the narrative, right? And, and, and this is, I mean, we live in a postmodern world, so if you can control the definition of terms, if you can control the language, you control the narrative, right? And this is what's, what's utterly important. And, and when we talk about this, especially 1619 Project, and the redefinition of, of things like racism and stuff like that, does true racism still exist? You betcha. Absolutely it does. We're sinful human beings. There's only one cure to that, and it's Jesus, right? But you can't redefine things away and say, I'm inherently racist because I just happen to be born a different color than you. Uh, because that statement is inherently racist by the old definition, right? Um, but if you can control the language, then you can control the narrative. If you can control the narrative, you control what people intake and, and believe, right? Yes, sir. You know, the CRT, if I remember right, that kind of started in the early 60s. It did, yep. There was a, a black scholar and economist, uh, Thomas Sowell, who originally did refute that, and then he refuted it more completely yeah. in the early 90s. Yeah, if you haven't, it, just to interrupt real quick, if you haven't read Thomas Sowell, you should on this, for but sure. That, you know, but they kind of belie their own premise because they say they're for the marginalized, the minorities, and all that. And yet, when you have a black scholar who refuted their basic premise, they marginalized him. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And, and it's, I mean, it's just, it, it's it, that, that internal inconsistency that we keep talking about, right? I mean, it, it, it happens in, in, uh, in things like abortion, right? If the, if the black population hadn't aborted their children at the rate that they had, they would be darn near equal to whites in terms of, of numbers, right? But that was all by design. <laughs> so, um, but we just got to we got to be able to see that, and that's that's one of the things that if you notice in all of these in all of these philosophies of education, both in pedagogical method and how the curriculum is designed and carried out, there is no emphasis on free thinking. There's none. We don't we don't want students to grow up to be th free thinkers, right? We want them to grow up to be thinkers after what we want, right? Because then they're easier to control. Uh -uh. Nope. The school of those children, of course, my wife, both in education and also in the organization, they're taking up more and more parental roles, uh, it's, again, according to what a Marxist society wants. Right. The property of the state. And there, you see that in numerous episodes in the United States, which have more and more and more and more that used to be the parent role. Yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. When, and, and that makes complete sense, right? What is, what is easier to control in terms of language and, and product? If I am dictating from the top down and dictating what has to be taught in the manner in which it has to be taught, then it's really easy to control. But I have a really hard time controlling what a mother and father does in their own home, right? And we're going we're to talk about this in terms of influence and time spent and, and things like that uh, shortly, right? So I think we've identified uh, many of the pitfalls, um, and we're just, I'm just going to tell you, yes, there is a better way of doing this. A lot of our, um, our Lutheran schools, um, we'd like to believe that they start from a Christian worldview, right? Um, so I'd ask you, the Lutheran schools that you are familiar with, that you have interacted with, what is their goal or end state? And, and, I mean, you could jump on your phone and go to a school that you're familiar with and, and pick, pick up their mission and vision. And I will tell you that most of them are very much similar with what I've read you today. Right? Um, now, Jesus is certainly prevalent in those mission and vision, uh, if they're a good, good Lutheran school. Um, but there's a great poem called Good Enough. 
And I want you to, if we talk about good Lutheran schools, we should never aspire to be good. We should aspire to be great. Uh, and good enough, uh, look that poem up and, and read it and it'll blow your mind uh, on these types of things. And it, it is about schools and communities. So w what should the goal or end state of a Lutheran school be? Faith and love. Faith and love? Okay, we've got to unpack those terms, right? Definitions matter, terms matter. Right, so faith in God and love for neighbor, probably, right? So that's, that's really good. If we talk about the telos, the end, the goal of the Christian life, if I asked you, what is the goal of the Christian life, what would you tell me? Blessed end. A blessed end. What do you mean by that? Dying in the faith. Dying in the faith, right? Um, that's good. Because if you die a blessed end, what is the, the happy consequence of the blessed end? Heaven. Heaven. Right? Now, I would say more than heaven. Uh, a lot of times we say that the goal of the Christian is to end up in heaven. We have a great Lutheran hymn that says, Heaven itself were void and bare if thou, Lord, wert not near me. Heaven is not the goal. Heaven is the location. Union with Christ and forever. Standing in the presence of God forever is the goal. If heaven is the goal, then Christ is the mere means or instrument for us attaining the goal. And it's not that. Our goal is to be in the presence of God forever. Whether that be in heaven or wherever God decides for it to be. Right Now certainly we, we don't devoid or, or cut, cut up scripture, but I do think we need to be clear on that. Because when, when you go back to your congregations and you're having Bible study and you ask people what heaven will be like, inevitably they'll say, I don't have to wash dishes or I get to play golf all day, which is obviously not true. Because if you've ever seen my golf game, Jesus promises no tears. And my golf game is about the saddest thing that has ever happened in this world. Um, but the point is to be in the presence, to see God, to know God as we are known, to see God face to face, that is the end or goal of the Christian life. For our Roman Catholic friends, they call this the beatific vision. And I think that actually encompasses more of what we're trying to convey than simply saying heaven. Right? Because then when you ask people what heaven's going to be like, they will never say, I get to stand in the presence of God. They say things like not washing dishes or or, uh, you know, playing golf. Warren said it's an endless buffet where I can eat all I want and not gain And not gain weight, right? So, yes, clearly one of the seven deadly sins will be uh, full march in heaven of, of gluttony, right? Um, so, if we say that the end or goal of the Christian life is to see God face to face for all of eternity, what should the end or goal of Lutheran education be? To prepare one for that blessed end. To bear up under the sufferings and challenges of this world and to come out as a good and faithful servant, being wrapped in the arms of our Lord and being told, well done. That is the end or goal. Now, does that mean that the things of this life and this world mean nothing? Of course not. We must have vocations, right? God gives us these things. They are from Him. Lutheran doctrine is great, isn't it? Doctrine of vocation is good. It's from God. And so we should be taking all of these things into account when we create a mission and vision statement in our schools. And that's what our schools should do. And thus, if the curriculum, if that is our worldview, the curriculum has to be, and the pedagogical method have to be conducive to delivering that. Because if they are not, if we're falling into these same things that we have just established are at times antithetical to the faith, most of the time antithetical to the faith, how can we possibly expect a great end result when our entire methodology is flawed and the content that we are giving is flawed? We can't. And yet, us pastors in here will scratch our heads and say, gee, I don't know why 30 years of catechesis and I don't have any parishioners because this has infected everything that we do especially our schools where do we as Lutherans get our curricula how much curricula for Lutheran schools does CPH produce anybody want to take a stab nada they'll do Sunday school so we have a great publishing house an expensive publishing house, pain in the butt to work with, but great, 
right? They do good things when they put their mind to it. They got good people that are there. They mean well. They, yeah. The road to hell is paved with good intentions, my friend. This is most certainly true. Amen. So what, where do we end up getting our curricula? State. State, which is infected with the things that we talked about. Other Christian, either pan-Christian. Actually, we get a lot of it from Baptist sources, Reformed sources. Most of, uh, I, I operate a classical school. Almost all of my stuff comes from Reformed sources because we are not doing it. And that is atrocious. We should be ashamed. We have enough successful and wonderful people gifted by God to be doing these things. I gave a, a paper. So for, in classical education, our, our governing group is the Consortium for Classical Edu Lutheran Education, CCLE. They had a, a conference last summer, as they do every summer, and I gave a paper tracing what, what uh, our Lutheran fathers did in terms of their curriculum, where they got it. And guess what they did? They wrote their own. Now, I am not a Philip, Philip Melanchthon. Uh, I can't write the way the man wrote. I am not as brilliant as God gifted that man to be. Uh, and so I probably am not the best one to write our rhetoric textbooks and our logic textbooks. I can teach those things. I love them, but I'm probably not that guy. But we do have people that can do that. And we're not using them. We have a publishing house that's not publishing this stuff. We should be developing our own. We spend all kinds of money doing all kinds of missions overseas, but yet we won't fork over funds right here in the United States to take care of our own churches and our own schools. Yes, sir? So have, they given, have you inquired as to why they're not, or is the answer that... It's always money, baby. It's always money. It's always money. We can't make money off of that. Yeah, it seems to be the general consensus. Yes, I have inquired why. Um, and I'm also pushing towards rethinking that, right? So I guess I could be one of those reconceptualists. Take, taking those things, but I'm pushing for it, right? I, I, the paper I gave last, uh, uh, most of you know Dr. Gene Veith. Uh, Dr. Veith is a fantastic and wonderful man, and I gave that paper, and thankfully Gene sat in on it, um, who's a great mentor and a wonderful friend, uh, and he said, all right, you've convinced me. We're going to start. We're going we're to figure this out. We're going to push for it. And so when you got a man of that, that caliber um, and that heart and a, and a wife next to him, to help with those things, Jackie is utterly fantastic. We'll get it done. It's going to take us a bit, but we'll get it done, at least on the classical side. Yeah. What can we do to help? Ask hard questions to people that are in charge about why it's not getting done faster and why we're not committing funds to it. Write resolutions when we have our next conventions so that we, and then, and then, and then send men, pastors, to go ask those hard questions on the floor uh, and trust that we can get a group of us enough that when we try to get ignored, we'll have enough at the mics to actually make it stick at some point in time. If you've ever been to a convention, there's a lot of political haggling that happens at these things. Yes, ma'am. Do you know in general like, what percentage in schools right now of children and families are moving? Uh, it depends. That's a hard question to answer uh, because it really depends on if it's a choice school or not. Right. Um, if you look at our Lutheran High School Association uh, in Milwaukee that manages Milwaukee Lutheran, Martin Luther, Lake Country Lutheran, and my school, and Mount Calvary Lutheran Grade School, uh, I think that is sitting um, overall at a shade over 50%. Now, Milwaukee Lutheran, I think it's, it's pretty low. Um, in terms of how many of those students are Lutheran. As you get out of the city, the percentage goes up. Right. I'm wondering if, like, those numbers would scream, like, we don't have Lutherans. Why are we, why are these families putting their kids out of our yeah, So, so this, is, this is a great question, and I won't get us too far off, but I, I'll, I'm going to handle this a little bit. Um, we have two ways that we can look at education. Um, and, and we can follow either a discipleship model, where we are trying to increase and strengthen the faith, of the students that are there, or what's the other model? Anybody knows? An outreach model, right? Uh, to where we're trying to make Christians. So what we do is we convince ourselves that that it's good that we're doing this because we're reaching the unchurched. Now, 
at, how many years has, has Choice been? It's been like 20 years, right? That Choice has been around in the state of Wisconsin, close to 20, I think. I've not seen a study, but I, I'm willing to, to bet the house that if we were to do a study and find out the percentage of those students that were unchurched that have become active members of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod on the back end of their schooling, it is a very low percentage. I bet it's a very, very low percentage. So we may say that we are doing this as, as a means of outreach, and yet the fruit of that work isn't there. Now, I have a love-hate relationship with choice. I have six kids. I live on a pastor's salary. I love my wife and my family enough that I really do everything I can to make sure she's with our kids. Right? Uh, I know that's not able to happen for some families, and I'm, this, isn't, this isn't me using the law to make you feel guilty. I'm just telling you what works. But we make a lot of sacrifices to ensure that, that she can be with our children. Um, We couldn't, we couldn't afford Lutheran schools without choice. We're, we're a choice family. All three of my students at my school are choice families. Right? Um, and I think it can be managed. Uh, I was a huge opponent of choice when I first got to Milwaukee. I was die hard. You will never get me to take a dime of government money. Right? Um, and I did that in ignorance, for one. Um, now some may just say I'm a sellout <laughs> right? I'm willing to take that a little bit but what, what I did is I went and met with the Wisconsin Institute of Law and Liberty Will, if you don't know this organization you should and I spent three and a half hours having their lawyers that stand up for religious liberty and rights in our state walk me through the legislation so that I understood it and understood how easily or not so easily it could get changed, right? And the way this legislation is written makes it, n it's not impossible, nothing's impossible, right? Uh, makes it next to impossible to change and make the government able to force you into teaching the things that, that they want you to teach. It is next to impossible to do. So much so that we actually have a governor that campaigned to eliminate choice who then got into office and not only not eliminated it, but signed in legislation of increases for the next 400 years. That should actually tell you something a little bit. Either Tony Evers figured out how to control the system, <laughs> which, which I'm willing to say might be the case, or he found out that you can't actually eliminate it. One, because we don't have the infrastructure in public schools to handle the amount of Lutheran schools that would be forced to close if you took all of that away, because it would be substantial. Right? So we, we already have over flooding and overcrowding in our public schools anyhow. Uh, and yet, their salaries go up every year. But yet, we're not, we're not actually taking care of them. That's another conversation. Um, so we, we made the, we made the, the decision to, to go with it. Now, what do I do? Because I have three other LCMS high schools that we are partnered with, I can look at a family. And I can unabashedly say, this is who we are. This is what we are about. Oh, by the way, Julie. When I met with you and Chris, did I tell you that this school will be hard and that well, there will be times that Rachel will want to quit and you as the mom and dad, if you believe in this education, you have to tell her no. Fight through it. Did I tell you that? All right. Just to make sure I'm not a liar. I'll give you the 20 bucks after. <laughs> give her an <laughs> I, will give her, I will give her the exact grade she earns, which is most of the time an A because Rachel's awesome. Um... I don't inflate grades. You get what you earn. Sorry. Because life's that way. Um, so we, we, need to, we need to be cognizant of all of these things. But, but if you make that clear, families will self-select out. I'll straight up tell a family, you may be better served at Milwaukee Lutheran or Martin Luther or Lake Country. And they don't feel like I'm discriminating because it's all part of the same association that manages it. And that makes it pretty, pretty easy to be able to do. Now, a family could absolutely override my recommendation and send their child. But they're going to find out real quick, right? Chris and Julie can attest that if, when the child doesn't want to do the homework, the parents got to step in and say, no, you actually have to lead the discussion on Tuesday, every Tuesday, Rachel. So on Monday night, you better be prepping. 
Because Pastor Coble is not going to take it easy on you. He's going to expect you to lead that discussion Socratically and well. And that's what I do, right? So if we are true to our mission and vision, if we are true to the identity, our worldview actually permeates everything we do, then we don't have these problems, all right? Uh, and on your bibliography, there's a, a book by a man named Eisner. Uh, and in that book, he talks about these, these hidden ideologies, right? I don't want anything hidden. You, you know, when you see me and sit down with me as a parent, you know exactly what you're going to get. You know exactly what your child's going to get. And I don't change. Because if I do, our mission will drift. And if my mission is to deliver an unchangeable God, how can I change? I can't, right? So we, we go through all those things.